Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 36 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. Before we jump into the episode that I've titled Random New Year Thoughts, You Can't Have the New Without the Old, it's time for our usual updates. First, as I'm sure most of you have seen, if you're on social media and follow me on Everyday Buddhism, my book was released on November 25th. So it's finally out there, thanks to so many people. And I've heard from some of you that you've bought the ebook or paperback and that you're really enjoying it and it's helping you. It's wonderful to finally share this thing I nurtured for more than a year. But if you haven't yet, please pick up a copy of the ebook or paperback or pick up two copies and share one with someone who might need it or like it to guide them in the coming year. And when you've finished it or got into it a bit so that you know what it's all about, please go back to Amazon to the book page and hit review this book. Reviews are very important in the Amazon ecosphere. So let's get the number of reviews up there so more people can discover the book, the podcast, and the everyday Buddhism way of being in the world. In podcast news, I have a special guest lined up for the start of the new year and a few more special guests coming soon after that. We'll be talking about Buddhist practice, pragmatic Buddhism, modern tantric Buddhism, the American Sutra, and what should be an interesting episode about music for meditation, healing, and transformation. And in other everyday Buddhism news, we've had another new member join the growing virtual Sangha in addition to the three new members that joined in late November and early December. So this uh, Sangha is growing. It's, 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 yes, it's virtual, but it doesn't fe feel virtual. We see each other. We smile at each other. We support each other. Um, we have the virtual practice or Sangha meeting every other Thursday evenings, but we also have a private Facebook group to share um, what's happening in our lives uh, during the weeks. So it's a wonderfully warm and loving place to support each other in our practice and in our lives and in our practice of life, learning more tips and tricks from each other and sharing what we're learning. Details and a link for joining the Everyday Sangha can be found on the first page of the Everyday Sangha website, www.everyday-buddhism.com. Check it out, especially if a virtual Sangha meeting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern U.S. time is at all possible for you. The next Sangha meeting is January 9th, 2020. Uh, we usually meet every other week, but due to the holidays, we aren't meeting again until January 9th. But with that news out of the way, it's time to get on with the episode. You know, I'm sure I'm not the only one commenting on how 2020 seems like something out of sci-fi. 2020. But here we are. And from my perspective approaching my 67th birthday in a little under two weeks, we are living in what was the sci-fi from my childhood perspective. We're living attached to our little mini computers, the ubiquitous smartphones, well, and we're talking into our watches and their self-driving cars. You know, it's my era's cartoon, the Jetsons, come to life. All except that device in the wall that hands you whatever you want to eat when you want to eat it. That'd be great, huh? So I imagine, though, that for most of my podcast listeners, none of what I just mentioned seems like sci-fi to you. 
It's not that new for you. It all depends on where you stand, your perspective. You know, when I was a kid, the first TV started appearing in homes. And then the first color TVs. You know, my father had a electronic shop or a radio shop, or I forgot what he called it, but he was the first to bring TVs to our small town in Ohio. And there were people, when he first had the TVs hooked up, and they were in the showroom window, and this was in a little shop attached to our house, um, people would stop, uh, delivery people, people that were going up and down the street, walk, pedestrians walking up and down the street, they would stop in front of the showroom window to watch TV. And sometimes people would interfere with the antenna, uh, antenna reception, so they'd have to kind of move out of the way and get in odd positions to make sure they could see it. Um, and this is no joke, very true. And then, uh, then there were the first color TVs, like I said, and because my dad had this electronic shop, we were the first family, one of the first families in town that had the first color TV. Um, then when, if you, if you go back to my parents' time, when they were young, cars were relatively new as common methods of transportation. And milk and ice were delivered to their houses. There, you know, there wasn't real refrigeration, so there were ice boxes. And sometimes that milk and ice were, was delivered in horse-drawn carriages. Can you imagine that? So at the edge of a new year and a new decade, I've been reflecting more and more on this, well, old thing. <laughs> it seems I've rounded the bend. At 65, the traditional age of quote-unquote seniorhood, I acknowledged that fact, but it didn't hang around much in my consciousness, and so I went on. Then at 66, there was a little more sense of, wow, this old thing is really happening to me. And here I am, just about 67, just days away. Yep, I've rounded the bend. I'm past the whole 65 is the new 45, and I'm laser locked on 70, and that's hopefully. At some point on this inexorable journey from life to death, you can have a complete awareness of where you are on the age spectrum. And then at other points, you can feel oddly disconnected from your age. Your mind is happily living at one age, say 38 or 45, but you are really 66. I've recently experienced more moments where the I in my mind or the self in my mind is in sync with my physical age. And maybe that's what the round the bend thing is, an awareness that I am that old. Now, don't think I'm the kind of person that's going to quietly sink into the abyss of age, complaining about, quote, how it was in my day, or yelling at kids to get off my lawn. You know, I still have a lot of plans, a lot of attention, intentions, a ton of mental energy and focus, and sometimes even bouts of physical energy. But 67, that round-the-bend place, seems like where you know it's the age of no escape. Many times I'm aware of my body's age and limitations. Well, almost daily. And many times I do catch my mental chatter muttering something about, they can't be old enough to drive, or you're really a doctor? You look like you're 12. In those moments, I'm profoundly aware of the inescapable fact that I'm old. Death is closer than birth for me. And, you know, I, I do realize that no one can say for sure that that isn't also true for them, no matter what age. We're all dying. And we don't know when death can happen. In this Buddhist world of causes and conditions, yes, birth is is the cause of death. So there it is. The seeming, depending on your view of things, beginning 
and end. Birth and death. Young and old. Birth and death. New and old. But you can't have new without old. There's an old person in every child. And there's a child in every old person. I am the me I've always felt my me to be. <laughs> that sounds like Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? But it's that slippery self. Yet now I'm seen as old because you are young. And I take with me into this new territory of old parts of my youth. It's like the new year. It's a random calendar assignment, the new year. Just like my age is the random assignment of age. As we begin this new year, everything from the old year comes with us. We may leave some things behind, but you know, not right away. We don't have our new 2020, 2020 circumstances and plans ready to switch on at midnight. No, we'll wake up, hopefully, um, banning un uh, unforeseen disaster, and we'll wake up the same person we were when we went to bed. In some ways, that's really comforting, right? It's only the labels of change, like the word new, or the word old, or the word sick, that can make us feel pressured to be different, to change, to be better, to be worse. Yet it is only in a reframing of things, rather than the labeling of things, that can change our perspective or change our focus and help us make life transitions, positive changes, and a brand new year. And making a new year less depressing or less scary or threatening and more comforting in living it rather than labeling it. You know, I'm reading this great book. It's called Aging as a Spiritual Practice by Lewis Richmond, who's a Zen Buddhist priest. I'll post a Amazon link to it on, on the website um, because it's, it, it, it's something that I really do encourage people to read whether they're young or old. It's probably not something most of my listeners will feel the urge to run out and buy since you're probably far removed from the round-the-bend moments I've been having. But there is much wisdom and an inspiration for you to take from it, no matter where you are on this journey we all share. In the book, Richmond refers to my round-the-bend moment as the term he calls lightning strikes. He says, quote, It is the moment we truly wake up to our aging and can see the full significance of it in our whole life, from its unremembered beginnings to its unknown end. Until that moment, regardless of our age, we spend much of our time not thinking too much about where our life is headed or what it all means, but once lightning strikes, it's different. We have reached a tipping point. We have stopped seeing things as we wished they were, and for a moment at least can see them as they actually are, unquote. You know, in the book, uh, Lewis retells the parable of the mustard seed, you know, the, the Buddhist parable of the mustard seed where Krisha, uh, a grief-stricken woman, brings the lifeless body of her baby to the Buddha so he will bring the child back to life. And so he assured her that he had the medicine to fix her grief, but that he needed a special ingredient, and so she needed to go get that. He told her to go to the houses in the neighborhood and try to take a mustard, mustard seed from any house that had never lost a child or a parent or a spouse or a friend. And I'm sure many of you know this parable. Cretia goes from house to house, and of course, there isn't a house that was not touched by death. With this practice, 
the Buddha assigned to Krisha, she awakened to the fact that her grief was not hers alone. This grief lives in everyone's heart. This is how you change perspective. This is how old becomes new and how new becomes old and how it all becomes words trying to describe this journey we all share. Some things can't be fixed. Some illnesses can't be healed. Grieving hearts will always feel a little grief. My old knees and feet will never feel like they did when I was 20. Shunru Suzuki writes about things that can't be fixed and gives a tough answer. He writes that there is only one way. Accept the problem and work on it through meditation. And by working on it, it's working on the acceptance of it. He said the only thing that really helps is to find some ground to stand on, understanding that you are here right now. So here we are. From where you sit, listening to this podcast, you may be filled with great hope or great despair at the coming new year. You may have pain, or you may feel the best you've ever felt. You may be young, or you may be old, but you are where you are. And we're all here with you. It may look different from where I'm sitting, but I am here right now just as you are. And together we'll enter 2020, another year, another decade on the calendar. But if we live at the moment in what Lewis Richmond refers to as vertical time versus horizontal time, we can have an awareness of just being here. Vertical time is the present moment with no before and after and no room for memories or imagined futures. That is the ultimate fact and it transcends the duality of new year, old year, young person, old person, well person, sick person. Yes, everything changes, and we are in motion on the horizontal time train. But, as Lewis Richmond says, in vertical time, everything is accessible. And every possibility is restful and free. May it be so. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, my book is launched and has been spotted in the wild. Many of you posted pictures on the Everyday Buddhism Facebook group holding my book or showing the book in your home. If you want to do that, I'd love to see more pictures. It would be great. You might have caught a couple of mine that I posted of my uh, great nephew Sam holding a book and my great niece uh, Shasta the dog reading the book. So your turn to be more creative in posting uh, a pic of everyday Buddhism in the wild. So if you haven't picked up your copy yet, go to the Everyday Buddhism website, www.everyday-buddhism.com, and click on the link to buy the ebook or paperback. It will take you right to the books page on Amazon. I appreciate any and all book purchases and would love it if you left reviews on the book page on Amazon. Reviews are very helpful to me and to other seekers who would benefit from reading the book. Think of it as, think of leaving a review as a practice of right effort, right speech, and right action. And if you would like to become a sponsor of this podcast and set up a recurring or one-time donation, please go to the Donate tab on my website, www.everyday-buddhism.com to be a supporter of everything Everyday Buddhism will hopefully grow to be. And I have some plans cooking for 2020. 
And don't forget, if you would like to talk with me and others about these podcast episodes and everyday Buddhism subjects, consider joining the Everyday Buddhism Sangha. It's growing, it's vital, it's supportive, and it's a compassionate group of people to share our everyday lives through a Buddhist lens. The Sangha meets live via Zoom video conference every other week, and the details are on the main page of the website. So, Happy New Year, and until next time, keep making your every days, every years, and your every decades better. <laughs>